Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Matt. I serve as a lead pastor here at ACC, and I just want you to know how, how thankful I am for each of you and your displays of generosity as we're going through this series. Uh, listen, I know that many of you know that right now, financially, it's not a great time as a church to be giving away an entire week's offering. Uh, but I, I see in each of you, and I want you to know, by the way, that we already set aside 10% of every offering that comes in and we put it in our missions fund, and it already we, we're already spending 10% all year long. It's about $130,000, $135,000 that goes into our community and into the nation, and, uh, helping with the church plants and, and missionaries throughout the world. So this is on top of that, and you guys are doing such a phenomenal job. I want you to know that even in spite of, in, in light of all of this, we are not a church right now that I feel like there's any want. I feel like God is taking care of us and it's because of you. So thank you so much for allowing this to happen. As we're, uh, as we're going through this uh, four-week series uh, on generosity, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the heart and the heart's element in this whole process. And I want you to know that I've always been a little bit uh, sensitive to the idea of the physical heart. Uh, many of you know that when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, my mom passed away suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart attack. And I remember uh, being you know, just called out of uh, algebra class on a normal day. And my mom was healthy. There was no signs that anything bad was going to happen. And it was just a day like any other. And except for uh, halfway through the day, I, f I found out uh, my mom had died. And because of that, now today, I, I, I pay attention to my heart a lot more than I probably would have otherwise. I I find myself, you know, seeing a cardiologist on a regular basis, just saying, hey, doc, you know, here's what happened to my mom. Make sure that my heart's not doing that same thing. And, and we, we pay attention to stuff like that. And I'm sure if you have heart disease in your family, you probably pay a little closer attention to your heart. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you have a little bit of, you know, you've, a little gassy or a little bit of heartburn and it's hurting a little bit too high up and a little bit too far to the left, right, it, it worries you a little bit. At least it does me, and it's, it's one of those things that, how, how cool would it be if as a church, we paid that close attention to our, our spiritual heart? You know, the, this idea of the word heart is something that we, we recognize, it's, it's a word that has many meanings in the Bible. We use heart to describe this physical muscle. We also use heart to describe things that we love. Uh, you know, we talk about our heart almost like it's our soul, it's the, the core of who we are. One thing that's interesting in Scripture is there are sometimes, back in, in Bible days, uh, they didn't consider the heart to be the core of the person. So when they would say, I love you with all of my uh, heart, wouldn't have made sense. They would be like, wait, what? You love me with that little muscle that's pumping? They would say, I love you with all of my bowels. <laughs> Guys, I don't recommend it. Um, 
Now we, we use, instead of our gut or our bowels to describe the core of who we are, we use this word heart. You know, when we tell someone that we love them with our heart, we, we, we're saying, I love you with like every bit of me, the depth of me. I want to really talk about heart today. And, and as we're talking about generosity, we have to go back to our theme verse, uh, the idea of where we get generosity from. And it comes from Ephesians 5. And here's what it says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Imitate God in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. And what this verse points out is two things. You can't not miss. Uh, you, you can't miss when you read this verse two things. One, God sacrificed and was very generous with you. In fact, I want to make it more personal for a moment. God was very generous to me. According to this verse, he sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in my place. And sometimes when I hear that personally, it means more. But I'll tell you what, when I hear it this way, it means even more to me. God sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in place of my wife and my daughters. And I love that, that generosity. And I want you to know, too, that God sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in your place. That's, you can't read this verse and miss the fact that our God is a generous God, that he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. But the other thing that we can't miss when we read this verse is that God calls you and I to imitate that kind of generosity. That ought to make you pause for a moment. I gave my life for you. Now go, Christian, and imitate that kind of generosity. And yet we struggle to even find little ways to be generous sometimes. So we're spending this month going through Scripture and looking at how we can be better at imitating the generosity of God. Our first week we talked about the idea of changing the way we think. We need to open our mind to renewing our minds and think more in line with the way God thinks and less in line with the, the way the world thinks. And then last week, we talked about opening our eyes. We talked about the idea that when you open your eyes, you're able to see the physical needs around you. You're able to see actual people struggling and hurting around you. But then you're also able to have spiritual eyes that see that wherever God calls you and whatever he calls you to do, when he calls you as a church to give money that you don't have to give, that he's got your back that he is a God of unlimited resources. And those spiritual eyes are so important in this process of generosity because if you want to be a generous person, you have to see things that maybe your physical eyes can't see. And then today, we want to talk about the heart. Now, here's the problem when we talk about uh, opening our hearts. Your heart is really messed up. Do you know that? My heart is really, really messed up. Have, have you ever gone to someone for advice about a big life decision, maybe you were getting a, maybe getting a new job or deciding to move somewhere or buy a house or maybe finding a, a, a partner to spend the rest of your life with and you're, you're finding a husband or a wife and you went to someone really well-meaning and they offered this advice to you, just follow your heart. Have you ever heard that before? I want you to know, <laughs> I'll be really clear here, that's terrible advice. Anytime someone tells you, listen, just follow your heart. Your heart is broken. My heart is broken. You and I really have no business doing what our heart tells us to do unless God's ruling it. Let me, let me show you a verse in Jeremiah 17, 9 about the condition of the human heart. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. How's that for encouragement, church? <laughs> hey, just follow your heart, church. Just follow the thing that is the most deceitful of all things. And by the way, throw this in there, it's desperately wicked. Like that is not something that you want calling the shots in your life, right? We don't want to follow desperately wicked hearts. And then it goes on, it says this uh, rhetorical question, who really knows how bad it is? Now, I ask that question, and we all think, yeah, we know the answer to that rhetorical question. 
Who really knows how bad our heart is? And you might think the rhetorical question you would answer with the word me, that I know how wicked my heart really is. And I believe, by the way, that you know a lot about your heart that no one else will ever know. You know things that you're struggling with right now that I don't know, that no one else around you knows. You know stuff that only you know, but I do not believe you know how wicked your heart is. You are not the right answer to this question. This rhetorical question, who knows how wicked and deceptive your heart is, the only answer is what? God does. God is a heart expert. God knows your heart inside and out. We know in, in Psalm 139, I believe, that God created your inmost being. He knit you together. He knows your heart intimately. In fact, God is not only the maker of it, he's the sustainer of it. Your heart, your physical heart is going to beat until he doesn't want it to anymore. God knows your heart inside and out. He knows what's desperately wicked in there. He knows what belongs in there and what doesn't. He is also, by the way, a lover of your heart. He loves you. He loves your soul. He loves every part of you. He doesn't like the fact that your heart is broken and deceptive, but he, he loves you nonetheless. And this idea of God being a heart expert, one, one place you can see that in Scripture, there's a story where, right, where uh, a new king needs to be crowned or needs to be uh, uh, anointed, and there's King Saul, and King Saul is not really doing what he's supposed to be doing anymore, so God tells Samuel to go to Jesse's house and to anoint a new king. So Samuel is going to Jesse's house, and Jesse has all of his sons, except for one, that are kind of at the house. Jesse's brought in all of his, like the ones that are probably going to be chosen, right? He brings them in, and, and Samuel's looking at them, and he thinks, when he sees the very first son, he says, this guy, he's strong, and he's handsome. He must be, he must be the one I'm supposed to anoint king. And uh, he, he keeps doing this through all the sons, and God says, says this, in 1 Samuel 16, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you see how now our eyes being open are a really important step before we get to the heart? Because when you open your spiritual eyes, we'll be able to see the heart of the matter. When we look at things with our physical eyes, we're going to see someone who's tall and strong and handsome and who looks like a king, and we're going to think this guy ought to be the king. But the Lord says, don't, don't look at people like that. Don't look at people just with your physical eyes. In fact, it says, I see things. God says uh, that he looks at the heart. God is a heart expert. What do we call a heart expert? cardiologist. In fact, the Greek word for heart is cardio. It's where we get all sorts of words that we use for heart, right? And, and I, I recognize in my own life, because of my history, I go see a cardiologist regularly. I go at least once a year for a routine checkup, not because there's something wrong, but because I want to make sure there isn't, right? With my physical heart, I want to make sure that I take the the stress tests and the EKGs and, and make sure that my heart is, I go see an expert on the heart, a doctor who knows the heart better than, than I do, who can tell me when there's something wrong or something needs to be fixed and, or tells me that things are good or what to do. We want to see a heart expert. And what I want to recommend today for each of us is that we see in this moment that God is the heart expert. He knows our physical hearts better than anyone else. He made them. And he knows our deep, spiritual, real selves. He knows our soul. He knows you inside and out. He knows everything that's going on in your life right now. He knows stuff that you would be just incredibly embarrassed if anyone else knew what was going on. God knows your heart. And what we need to do is, is we need to go see a cardiologist, the great cardiologist, and have him open up our hearts and make things right so that we can be imitators of God and we can be generous like he's generous. Now, one thing you're going to notice, though, about a cardiologist is there's not a cardiologist in the world who you're going to go see them and they're going to say, listen, I'm going to take care of everything. You don't have to do anything. If you go see a cardiologist, they're going to 
If there's something wrong, they're going to do their part, but then they're going to send you away with your part. They're going to tell you that you got to do certain things. You need to protect your heart. You need to exercise it. You need to keep certain things out of your body, put certain things in your body. There are things that you will have to do. This process of a healthy heart, of an open heart, it needs to be a, a shared responsibility. So let's look at some of these steps of what might happen when you go see a cardiologist and what the great cardiologist is going to do and what you're going to need to do. And the first thing I want to talk about is, is step number one. You need to purify your heart. One of the best times, by the way, to go see a cardiologist is when you know there's something wrong with your heart. When it's not working right, when your body's not working right, when there's something, just things aren't pumping right or something, you're not feeling well, right? Well, oftentimes, you go see your primary care and they'll send you to maybe a cardiologist if that's what they think is the problem. And, and your cardiologist, that's the best place for you to be if there's something wrong with your heart. But get this, the very first step in this process of purifying your heart is on your shoulders. You have to do something called making an appointment. You have to call the cardiologist. You have to recognize and trust the cardiologist as the one who can fix your problem. You need to go see the cardiologist, and I promise you the cardiologist will keep the appointment and will do what the cardiologist is supposed to do. Let's, let's actually read a verse on that. It says in Romans 10, verses 11 through 13, as the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. In other words, listen, anyone who goes to see God about your heart, you will not get turned away. The calendar will not be full. You will get an appointment right then and there if you want to see. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. He sees patients generously who make an appointment with him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Don't miss this. If you need to see a cardiologist about your physical heart being messed up, what are you going to do? You're going to make an appointment, and you're going to go see that doctor to get healthy again. In the same way, all of us spiritually, we are messed up people. Our hearts are desperately wicked. They're deceitful. We all understand that we need to make an appointment with the only person who's capable of really knowing our hearts and knowing what to do with them and how to purify them, and that's God. The Bible is very clear about this. If you've never made that decision before, if you're still kind of exploring your faith and trying to figure out what church is and who Jesus is, I want you to know very clearly from this verse that when you call on the name of the Lord, when you trust that Jesus is the only one who can make your heart clean again, who can purify your soul, that's the appointment you need to make. You need to trust the great cardiologist with your heart and he will do the work. And that leads us to the other thing. Who does the work? You cannot purify your own heart. Your heart is so messed up. You are so messed up. You cannot go under a, a anesthesia and cut yourself open and work on your own heart. It just doesn't work that way. Only God can do the work that needs to happen deep inside of you. There's a... Uh, in, in, in scripture, remember King David. King David is someone that we know from the New Testament. God calls him a man after his own heart. So King David, he's a pretty cool guy. We just heard about Jesse's sons. Well, King David was the, the young son that was out in the field that was a little pipsqueak that nobody would have thought he was the one. But he was the one. And he gets appointed king. And he grows up into a guy who outwardly is actually pretty tall and handsome and strong. And all the ladies are into David. And, and he becomes king. And, and for the most part, we see David living a life that honors God, that follows God, that does what God wants. But we also see some moments of weakness in David's life. Just like I look at my own life and I see all sorts of moments of weakness in my life. And you are probably the same. And there's one instance in particular where David, it says he was looking out and he saw a, a woman who was in a bath and he lusted after her and, and he ended up calling her into his, his palace and he committed adultery. She was a married woman and ended up getting her pregnant. And then to cover that up, he ended up sending her husband to the front lines so that he would get murdered in, in war. Uh, so he ultimately was guilty of committing adultery 
and then committing murder to cover it up. This is the David, King David of the Bible. And at one point, he's confronted about his sin. I love this. Uh, there's a, there's Nathan is a prophet that visits David, and he calls him to the, he basically calls him out and says, listen, here's what you did. I know, and God knows what you did. And David writes a song. Most of the psalms that you read are songs. Many of them were written by David. And David writes a particular song in Psalm 51. And this is what he says. Remember, Nathan has just confronted him about his sin. David says, purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. First of all, can you just acknowledge how confident David is in this statement? God, I'm going to go see you, and you're going to take care of it. Can we have that kind of confidence that when we go see God and say, God, I need you to purify my heart right now, that you know he's going to do it. He says, purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove my stain. Uh, remove the stain of my guilt. And then it says this, and this is the phrase I really want to focus on. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. And here's where I want to pause. I want to ask that maybe some of you right now, this is where you're at. You need to make an appointment. You need to go see the great cardiologist who's going to keep the appointment, and you need to say simply, Doc, my heart's messed up right now. You know, because you know my heart better than even I do, and I need you to purify me. I need you to cut out. I need, to, I need you to go in there with an open heart surgery, and I need you to scalpel out what doesn't belong. I need you to stint this. I need you to fix that. I need you to sew this up. God, you know how broken my heart is, and I need you to get in there and do some work. Maybe that's you, uh, and, and you're kind of, you need to focus on step one today and asking God to purify your heart. Many of you maybe need to take that step for the first time. You've never before asked God to be the Lord of your life, and this would be the first time you've ever made an appointment with God to go in and, and be the Lord of your life. Here, here's a second thing I want to talk about is to protect and prepare your heart. Protect and prepare your heart. Now remember, you have to make an appointment. That's on you. The, the great cardiologist is going to do the purifying of your heart. And now we get to this second step where we have two more P words, protect and prepare. This is on you. This is where you take, uh, listen, when, when you leave the cardiologist after getting a heart surgery, if you leave the cardiologist after having had work done on your heart, you are going to get homework from the cardiologist. He's going to tell you to exercise. She's going to tell you to run more. Maybe he's going to tell you that you need to eat better foods. Maybe she's going to tell you to stay away from this or from that, exercise, whatever it is. The point is, a good cardiologist is always going to give you next steps. Here's how to now protect the heart that we've made healthy again within you. How do you take this newly purified heart? Maybe it's a brand new heart. Maybe it's a heart that's been surgically fit. How do you take your heart now and protect it? What do you need to stop doing that you were doing before to protect your heart? What do you need to start doing that you weren't doing before to protect your heart? One, one example of this is if I wanted to go out tomorrow and run my first marathon, that would be foolish. I'm telling you right now. I haven't prepared. The only running I did today was from the office to here because it was raining. That's about, that's about the extent of my running. You know, I'm a parking lot runner in the rain. That's about it. If I wanted to run a marathon, what I'm going to do is, is, is prepare, right? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to purposely take in uh, the right foods. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat the right things. I'm going to make sure my cholesterol level is not too high. I'm going to go out and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to get my body physically ready. I'm going to get my heart 
pumping and, and get, get it used to whatever it is I need to do to be able to go and run a marathon. And then maybe a year from now, maybe. <laughs> is that really that funny? Fine. <laughs> Two years from now, I'll be ready, right? The point is, when you have a heart that has been fixed, it's been restored, that it's clean, you are responsible to protect it and to prepare it. Let's look at this in Scripture. In Proverbs 4, this is a book that we go to for wisdom. It says, my child, pay attention to what I say. I love any time the Bible says this, because listen, if it's in God's word, you ought to pay attention to what it's saying. But when God goes out of his way to say, whoa, whoa hold on, this is extra important. Really stop for a moment and pay attention to this. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Okay, now not only is he saying listen, but he's saying listen three times. Have you ever had that with your kids? You pull your kids over and you're like, all right, now hold on. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. And he goes again, what I'm about to say, I don't want you to forget it. This is really important, all right? This is God sitting us down. My child, pay attention. Listen carefully. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Here it is. Guard your heart. This is the thing right here. Guard your heart. Protect your heart. Prepare your heart above all else, for it determines the course of of your life. If your heart isn't guarded and protected, if your heart is a filthy mess, it will determine the course of your life. You won't be able to imitate God well with a heart in that condition. According to scripture, though, that when we allow God to purify our heart and then we go and we guard our heart, the NIV says, the way the NIV words this verse is it will bring health to your entire body. When you can protect your heart, it'll bring health to everything else in your life. Here's a third thing I want to uh, spend some time on, is that we need to purpose our hearts. Do you know that God has a very specific calling and purpose for your life? No one in this room, despite what maybe your parents told you, you were not an accident. <laughs> God knew exactly what he was doing when he brought you into this world because he had a very specific purpose and plan for your life. Some people have a very short purpose and a very short time span of, of life. Some people have more, but despite the, what that amount of time is, it's not, re, not important. The point is that God has a purpose for you being here. And what we need to do is recognize that when we have our minds renewed and our eyes open, not only physically and spiritually, and then we are opening our hearts to being cleaned out and to being protected, and we're, we're practicing and, and, and getting better at and exercising this muscle of imitating God, that we now need to get our hearts in line with the heart of God. This is what I mean by purposing your heart. You need to get your heart in line with God's heart. What is it that breaks God's heart? My prayer for you is that that will break your heart too. What is it that makes God's heart jump for joy? I pray that your heart will jump for joy with that. I, what is it that, that, that I don't know, uh, makes... God happy. I, wanna, I want your heart to be so in line with God's that you recognize the purpose and plan that he has for your life and you run for it with all of your heart. We, we use a word sometimes to describe this and it's the word passion. All of you in this room have something you're passionate about. Maybe you're passionate about a certain hobby or you're passionate about a certain need or you're passionate about a certain person. One of the ways we use this word passion is it shows what you really care about. Think about this for a moment. When Jesus Christ had, had been alive 33 years and he went up on the cross for you, what do we call the week leading up to that moment? We call that passion week, right? 
And when we make a movie about Jesus being hung on the cross, we call it the passion of the Christ. We understand that passion is a word that we use to describe what we really care about, what, what our, our hearts are really kind of in line with, what, is, is, what it is that we, that we really that we think is important. And I, I want us all to purpose our hearts so that our hearts are in line with and in tune with the heart of God. Let me show you this in Scripture. Matthew 25. If you have a Bible with you today, would you open up your Bibles with me to Matthew 25? If you, don't, if you didn't bring your Bible with you today, uh, we have a Bible for you right in front of you in the chair back. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 25. And we're going to start in verse 31, and here's what it says. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered in His presence, and He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And we will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Let me, before we go into this next verse, listen to this. Essentially what, what's happening here is God saying, when I come back, when I come back again, and, and, and kind of this whole thing is over, and I'm, I'm, and I'm re- returned the second time, I'm going to separate people into people who loved me and gave their life to me and trusted me and people who, who made the free will choice to not have me as part of their lives. And he's going to separate those two people uh, two people groups into, sh- just like a shepherd would, separate sheep from goats. All right, so that's what he's talking about here. And then he goes on, is, it, it, it says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And here's the problem with this. Now all the the righteous, you're probably sitting here in this room right now thinking, when have I ever seen God hungry? Like, you're probably thinking, God, when when did I see you hungry? And feed you. This doesn't make any sense. And this is the problem they're, they're experiencing right here. In fact, we see as we keep reading, it says, Then the righteous ones will ask or will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? I don't know about you, but I've never seen with my two physical eyes, I've never seen God sitting on a street corner, hungry. I've never had the opportunity to see uh, God in need of clothes and provide clothes for God. I've never seen God in prison and have an opportunity to visit him in prison. But So these people are confused. This verse doesn't, you know, this, this comment from God doesn't make sense. And then it says this, and the king will say, I tell you the truth. I don't want you to miss this. And the king will say, I tell you the truth, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. I really want to make sure we all understand what what just happened here. You know, um, maybe seven Christmases ago, we had just finished up with all of our Christmas tradition stuff, and all the presents were opened, and we're all sitting there, and I think it was my my oldest daughter, Michaela, who said, why do we get all the presents on Jesus' birthday? That's a good question. In other words, what she's saying is, why don't we buy presents for Jesus on Jesus' birthday? And when it's my birthday, uh, people buy presents for me. And when it's your birthday, people buy presents for you. Why on Jesus' birthday do we buy presents for each other? And no, nothing for him is essentially the question that was asked. And it, it led us back to this verse. And it changed the way that we've done Christmas for a, quite a while now. On Christmas, one of my favorite traditions is we wake up in the morning on Christmas morning and we, we have cake for breakfast. Tell me that's not a cool tradition. 
and we light candles, and we sing happy birthday to Jesus. That's how we start off our day. We recognize that we're celebrating his birthday, we're celebrating him, that nothing we're about to do is about us. And then we sit down at that table together and we open up uh, Compassion's gift catalog or Samaritan's Purse's gift catalog, and we look through those catalogs together and we see uh, the actual needs around the world, people who don't have any food to eat or don't have uh, mosquito nets or don't have uh, Bibles in their language or don't have any goats and sheep and chickens that they can provide uh, for their family. And we see actual real need all over this world and we recognize the one way we can buy presents for Jesus on his birthday is by buying for the least of these. I want you to know that when you go out of here today and you see someone with a need, and you meet that need, the Bible says that you're giving a gift to Jesus Christ. When you recognize someone in your community who has a need, and you lend something to them, you are lending to Jesus. When you give, you're giving to Him. When you care for someone, you're caring for Jesus. Anytime you see someone with your renewed mind and your open eyes that has something that God's calling you to do, in that moment, when you reply and answer with generosity, you are doing it for Jesus. So we need to purify our hearts, and we need to protect and prepare our hearts, and we need to purpose our hearts. We need to in li- get our passion in line with God's. When we see someone hungry, we need to feed them. When we see someone thirsty, we need to give them something to drink. When we see someone with a real need, we need to meet that need as a community because the Bible is clear that when God's heart is broken, our heart ought to be broken too. So let's, uh, as we normally do, we wrap up with this idea of what now? What do we do? What now, God? In light of all of this, what we've been talking about, I want to I wanna challenge you with four things. The first challenge is this. Maybe you need to start with the purify heart idea. Maybe you're in this room right now and you need to give your heart to Jesus for the very first time. And if that's you, I want to invite you. And when we sing this last song to to make your way up here, I'm going to be standing uh, by these front chairs. And I want you to come and tell me, I want to give my life to Jesus. And I I will spend some time. I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want to tell you what next steps you need to make in your life to go let Jesus take care of your heart problem. And for those of you who have already given your life to Jesus, but you haven't been taking care of your heart and you need to get some, you need to go back in for a cleaning, I want to encourage you today, purify your heart. Because when your heart is deceitful, it's going to keep you from being a generous church. When your heart is only thinking about what you care about and what you like, it's going to keep you from being a generous person. We need to, number one, we need to purify our hearts. Another thing I want to encourage you to do today is to protect your heart. What is it that you're doing right now that you need to stop doing? Is it something that maybe it's a good thing that you just do too much of? Maybe it's a bad thing that you shouldn't have in your life at all. What is it you need to cut out from your life to protect and guard your heart? I also want to talk about this idea of preparing your heart. Remember we talked about with a marathon that you need, to, you need to exercise generosity. If you, if you go out and you exercise what it feels like to be generous, you're going to learn this thing called muscle memory, right? You're going to be good at being generous. You're going to become a more generous person. So I want to give you this morning the tool, uh, a tool that you can use to be generous. Uh, in fact, I want to invite our host team forward right now. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to give every single person in this room right now a $5 bill. So they're going to come forward. Everyone, if you're here, if you have a baby with you, your baby gets a $5 bill, all right? So everybody, every heart in this room, I want you to have a $5 bill before we leave. Go ahead and hand those out. Now, those of you who came with a family, if there's two of you, guess what? You got $10. There's five of you, you got $25. If there's one of you, you got $5. I want to encourage you to, to take what we're calling our $5 challenge today I want you to do this today. I want you to figure out how you can be creatively generous with that gift. And maybe you need to add a little bit to it. Maybe God's going to prompt you to add your own $5 to the mix and to go out today and find someone in our community that you can bless with that gift. 
And I want you to be as creative as you can be. Whatever God puts on your heart, that's what I want you to do. And I would love for you to tell me and tell the church your story. Maybe take a photo. Maybe uh, shoot a little quick video. And we're going to take all those photos and all those videos and combine them in the video we watch next week. I want to see you be generous. I want you to prepare and, and exercise and practice that act of generosity. Here's how you can do that. Number one, you obviously you take the, the money. The second thing, I want you to, to pay it forward today. I want you to find some way you can be generous with it today. And the third thing is share it. And the way you share it is you go onto our Facebook page, not your Facebook page, because then we can't use it. Go onto our Facebook page and post your photo or your video. Or if you prefer Instagram, share it to your Insta story and we can download it from there. Share with us what God's prompting you and your family to do with your money. And here's the fourth thing that I want you to consider is always be thinking about your purpose. What is it that God has put you on this earth to accomplish? One thing I know is that it involves generosity because our God is a generous God and he wants you not to love you and we, we love ourselves, right? God made us, and that's great, but the, the ultimate purpose that God put us on this earth for is to love God and love others. And in order to do that, you have to be a generous person. What is your purpose? How is God calling you to live generously in your life? Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us so much that you sent your son to this earth, that you showed an incredible act of generosity to us by by giving us the gift of your son to die on the cross in our place. God, as we seek now to imitate that generosity in our lives, we ask you help us to purify our hearts. You help us to protect and prepare our hearts for, for better acts of, of love towards you and others. God, then ultimately, you give us a purpose and a mission that's aligned with the passion of your own heart. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.